welcome back dear students once again you are welcome today we are going to learn the interrelationship between fundamental rights and directive principles of state policy dear students individually we have studied both the concepts that is the chapter of fundamental rights part 3 of constitution of india and then we have separately studied part 4th a rather part 4th of constitution of india that is director principles of state policy whereas part 4th a relates to fundamental duties that too we have covered now let us see <coughs> the relationship between fundamental rights and director principles of state policy and out of these two which one is to prevail upon the other is the main central point of this discussion today dear students an individual leads to a life which requires some rights and rights have been described as those claims of an individual that are necessary for the development of his own self and recognized by the society or state some of the rights that are recognized by the state and enshrined in the constitution are called fundamental rights fundamental rights are those rights of an individual that are enforceable through court of law this is the first beauty of fundamental rights that they are enforceable through courts of law if we have a look on the total number of fundamental rights given in our constitution they can be divided into following six categories the first is right to equality contained in article 14 to 18 then we have right to freedom certain freedoms are given in article 19 to 22 then we have fundamental right against exploitation that nobody should be exploited they are contained in article 23 and 24 then we have fundamental right to freedom of religion that is contained in article 25 to 28 and then we have fundamental right of cultural and educational rights contained in article 29 and 30 and finally we have fundamental right to constitutional remedies under article 32 as all of you know that under article 32 supreme court has powers to issue directions orders in the nature of five writs and five writs as you know are habeas corpus mandamus prohibition co warranto and certiorari so far as directive principle of state policy are concerned they are included in part 4th of indian constitution and indian constitution is one amongst few of the world that has incorporated such provisions as part of the main body of the constitution the constitution makers were inspired to include directive principle of state policy in the constitution by the constitution of ireland so basically we have adopted these directive principles of state policy from the constitution of ireland and one of the main objective of the constitution makers in including such a provision in the constitution was to lay down certain principles for the guidance of the government while formulating their policies the governments are expected to accord to these principles dear students the directive principles of state policy they are the guidelines for the framing of laws by the government these provisions set out in part 4th of the constitution of course they are not enforceable by courts but the principles on which they are based are the fundamental guidelines for the governance that the state is expected to apply 
in framing and passing the laws. Now we'll see the relationship between part third and part fourth of the constitution, whether fundamental rights should be given preference and directive principles should be given a backseat driving or other way around, the directive principles should be given preference and fundamental rights should be suppressed. Or the third option is that part third and part fourth are equivalent to each other and they form a balance and harmony between them. So this is the main point of discussion in this remaining part of this lecture. You see the genesis and objectives underlying part third and part fourth have common desideratum in responding to the social consciousness rest with the constitution making force. While fundamental rights focus on interest of personality, the directive principles look on to the welfare of the society. The judicial remedies for fundamental rights and non justiciability of directive principles are the deliberate strategies of the constitution. And the dichotomy between part third and part fourth and the supremacy of former over the later equation is three upon four. This was held in state of Madras versus Champakam Dorai Rajan. But this ratio decidendi of this Champakam Dorajan's case did not last for long because by first constitutional amendment act, the ratio decidendi of this Champakam Dorai Rajan was overruled. As all of you know that in this case, the state of Madras had issued a government order by which they reserved certain seats in medical and engineering colleges. But Supreme Court had struck down that communal government order of the state of Madras, saying that you cannot grant reservations in compliance of directive principles of the state policy. So that was the situation in Champakan Torai Rajan's case. As I told you the facts of this case that in this case, a government order of the Madras government divided seats in colleges on the basis of religion and caste. And this was repugnant to article 29 clause 2. But it was argued that the government order could be supported on the basis of article 46 of constitution. Because 46 says, that state is responsible for promoting educational interests of the weaker sections of the people. So state has made this geo, reserving certain seats on the basis of religion and caste. But Supreme Court held that the fundamental rights under Article 29 Clause 2 over the directive principles under Article 46. So the government order was struck down by the Supreme Court and it was held that in case of any conflict between part third and part fourth, the part third would prevail. What the government was doing? Government was promoting the directive principles contained in article 46 and was suppressing the fundamental rights. So Supreme Court says no. If fundamental rights under article 29 clause 2 are to be implemented, then directive principles of the state policy have to be suppressed. And the court gave preference to fundamental rights over the directive principles of state policy. So the equation remained three upon four. Three upon four means that part third was given preference and part fourth relating to directive principles was suppressed. So, State of Madras versus Champakan Dorai Rajan, the Supreme Court's approach was rigid as it held that directive principles of state policy cannot override the provisions contained in part third of the Constitution of India, but have to conform to and run as subsidiary to fundamental rights. It discerns that the apex court in its analytical positivist approach held that directive principles of the state policy 
are subordinate to fundamental rights. So the equation remained 4 upon 3. These observations of the Supreme Court were based on the literal interpretation of provisions of Article 37, which declares the director principles not justiciable. The remarkable change had come over in the judicial attitude on the question of their interrelationship in due course of time. However, this judicial view about the status and fate of director principles underwent a change in Muhammad Hanif Qureshi versus State of Bihar. This case was related to prohibition of slaughter of cows and calves. So Supreme Court, while discussing the conflict between Article 48 <coughs> and Article 191G, the fundamental right to carry on any trade, profession, or business, so Supreme Court held that prohibition of slaughter of cows and calves cannot be held to be an unreasonable restriction upon the right conferred by Article 19.1g of Constitution of India. And it unequivocally opined that fundamental rights and directive principles are to be tested on the touchstone of harmony. And as such, both are supplementary and complementary to each other. There is no question of one dominating upon the other. So the equation has changed. Equation was 3 upon 4. Now it is 3 is equal to 4. That part third, fundamental rights, are supplementary and complementary to the directive principles contained in part 4. The directive principle contained in article 48, they are very specific. And state has an obligation to organize animal husbandry on modern and scientific lines, in as much as to preserve and improve the breeds and prohibit the slaughter of cows and calves and milk and drought cattle in order to protect the milk animals progeny. So Article 19.1G of the Constitution of India gives every citizen to practice any profession or to carry on any occupation, trade or business, but subject to reasonable restrictions contained in Article 19 Clause 6. So here in this case also court said that the right to carry on trade and profession, you want to sell the cow, you want to sell the cow meat is your business. But the restrictions which the state has imposed are also reasonable in order to implement the directive principle contained in Article 48. So Supreme Court, while upholding the Uttar Pradesh and Bihar states cow slaughter acts, opined that these acts have been enacted in pursuance to Article 48 of Constitution of India. And as such, the prohibition of slaughter of cows and calves cannot be held to be unreasonable restriction upon the rights conferred by Article 19.1G of Constitution of India. They are reasonable restrictions upon the fundamental right to carry on any trade or profession or business. So we are implementing the directive principles of the state policy, but at the same time, we are imposing a reasonable restriction on the fundamental right given in Article 19, 1G of Constitution of India. Then we have, dear students, another turning point, another important leading case in uh, regarding Kerala Education Bill. In this case, Supreme Court observed that though the directive principles cannot be, cannot override the fundamental rights, nevertheless, in determining the scope and ambit of fundamental rights, the court could not entirely ignore the directive principles but should adopt the principles of harmonious construction and should attempt to give effect to both as much as possible. So here the theory of harmonious construction between part third and part fourth was given. So equation remained three is equal to four. That is part third relating to fundamental rights will be given equal weight 
as compared to directive principles of state policy contained in part four. So dear students, these articles, namely article 19, providing you the freedoms and 48, giving you certain directions or policies, they would be construed harmoniously and seen as supplementary and complementary to each other and none is subservient to anyone. However, this view towards the status of directive principles again underwent a change, rather a complete change in Keshwanand Bharati versus State of Kerala, a case relating to right to property, wherein the Supreme Court said that what is fundamental in the governance of the country cannot surely be less significant than what is fundamental in the life of an individual. This was the opinion of the Supreme Court in Keshwanand Bharati's case. It is submitted that Article 12 to 35A, that is part third relating to fundamental rights, and Article 36 to 51, part fourth relating to directive principles of state policy, are not mutually antagonizing each other. But they are mutually harmonious, mutually reciprocal, mutually friendly, and mutually complementary as well as supplementary to each other. This is the latest position. Then we have another case of uh, Muhammad Ahmed Khan versus Shah Banu Begum. In this case, Supreme Court granted maintenance to a divorced Muslim wife under Section 125 of CRP. And they went step forward by observing that Constitution of India is founded on a bedrock of balance between part third and part fourth of Constitution of India. And to give absolute primacy to one over the other is to disturb the harmony of the Constitution. So this opinion of the Supreme Court was regarding the interpretation of Article 44. That is Uniform Civil Code and Article 25 relating to freedom of religion. And it discerns that directive principles of state policy do not represent the temporary will of a majority, but they represent the wisdom of the nation expressed about permanent welfare of the country. So here also, the Supreme Court took the view that by granting maintenance to Muslim ladies, we are heading towards uniform civil code. We are giving them freedom of religion, of course, no doubt. But a Muslim divorced lady is also entitled to maintenance under Section 125, so as to bring uniformity between Hindus, Muslims, Christians, and Parsis, those who are claiming maintenance under Section 125 of CRP. Then we had a very path-breaking judgment, pavement dwellers case of Olga Telis versus Bombay Municipal Corporation. This case was decided by the Supreme Court in 1986. And it was held in this case that eviction of pavement dwellers would violate their right to life. In this case, the Bombay Municipal Corporation had demolished and removed the pavement dwellers from the roadside. So Supreme Court held that eviction of pavement dwellers would violate their right to life by depriving them of their livelihood, where they will live, where they will work. So Supreme Court emphasized that the principles contained in directive principles, particularly Article 39A and 41, must be regarded as equally fundamental in understanding and interpreting to the meaning and content of fundamental rights. If there is an obligation upon the state to secure to the citizens an adequate means of livelihood and right to work, it would be sheer pedantry to exclude the right of livelihood from the content of right to life under Article 21 of the Constitution of India. So while implementing directive principles contained in Article 39 and 41, we must keep in mind that once you are removing the poor persons from payment, their right to life is also affected. 
So you cannot do such a thing which affects the life and liberty as fundamental right of the pavement dwellers. Then came I.R. Silho versus State of Tamil Nadu. In this case, certain land acquisition laws were kept in ninth schedule by a constitutional amendment. It was held by the Supreme Court that a law which abrogates or abridges rights guaranteed by Part 3rd, in consequence, actual effect and impact of the law, whether by amendment or by keeping it in the ninth schedule, such a law will be invalidated in exercise of judicial review. Meaning thereby that even if you keep a law in ninth schedule, it does not mean that Supreme Court cannot struck it down or Supreme Court cannot declare it void. Again, the question was the implementation of directory principles of state policy and keeping fundamental rights also alive at the same time. So if you are keeping certain laws in ninth schedule in order to give them full protection from attack in order to implement the directive principles of state policy. So Supreme Court says that such a law will be invalidated in exercise of power of judicial review. You see, all constitutional amendments which were made on or after 24th April 1973, this is the date of judgment of Keshwanand Bharti's case, by which ninth schedule is amended by inclusion of various laws, shall be tested on the touchstone of essential or basic features of constitution of India, meaning thereby that law will be open to attack on the ground that it destroys or damages the basic structure of constitution of India if the violated fundamental right pertains to basic structure. This is the change in the legal position from the date of judgment of Keshwan and Bharti's case, that is 24th April 1973, that all constitutional amendments made on this day or after this day, which keeps any law in 9th schedule that law shall be tested on the touchstone of basic feature of the constitution of India. If that law violates the basic feature, it has to be struck down. Even if you are saying that we are implementing the directive principles of state policy, but you cannot do so because you are somehow touching the basic feature of the constitution of India, which is not allowed after 24th April 1973 the date of judgment of Keshwan and Bharti versus state of Kerala. So the Supreme Court emphasized that to destroy the guarantee given in part third in order to purportedly achieve the goal of part fourth is plainly to subvert the constitution by destroying its basic structure. <clears throat> Fundamental rights occupy a unique place in the lives of civilized society and have been described as transcendental, inalienable, and primordial. So in view of, I'm talking about Keshwanand Bharti's case, that in view of Article 31C of Constitution of India, certain laws which were enacted for taking further mandate of directive principles, as enshrined in Article 39B and C, were protected even if they violated fundamental right by the 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act 1976, the Article 31C was further amended to expand the scope which was earlier restricted only to Article 39B and C to include the entire directive principles. Meaning thereby, if you see the impact of this, Similar is the case where an amendment was also sought to be made to Article 368 by insertion of Clause 4, which took away the power of judicial review. Clause 5 was also inserted in the said article, which provided that there shall be no limitation on the power of the parliament to amend the constitution. These two clauses 
368 clause 4 and 5 came into consideration before the Supreme Court in Minerva Mill Limited versus Union of India, wherein the said amendments were held invalid by majority of 4 is to 1. However, while doing so, the said judgment also emphasized the importance of directive principles of state policy. Justice Y. B. Chandrachu, speaking for the majority held in this case, that part third and part fourth are like two wheels of a chariot. See the language. No one is less important than other. You snap one and the other will lose its efficacy. They are like a twin formula for achieving the social revolution, which is the ideal which the visionary founders of the constitution set before themselves. In other words, dear students, the Indian constitution is founded on the bedrock of balance between part third and part fourth. To give absolute primacy to one over the other is to disturb the harmony of the constitution. This harmony and balance between fundamental rights and directive principles is an essential feature of our constitution. The importance given to directive principles by the Supreme Court could be seen in the case of Woman Raw versus Union of India also, a later development wherein the validity of Maharashtra Agriculture Land Ceiling on Holdings Act 1975 was challenged. Rejecting the challenge, Supreme Court stated that, in fact, far from damaging the basic structure of the Constitution, the laws passed truly and bona fide for giving effect to directive principles contained in Article 39 B and C of 39 will fortify that structure. And they said that we do hope that Parliament will utilize to the maximum its potential to pass laws genuinely and truly related to the principles contained in Article 39, Clause B and C. So Supreme Court has again emphasized the value of directive principles of state policy in this case. And we are, what we are doing by this act, ceiling act, we are putting a ceiling on the amount of land which one person can keep so that the surplus land is distributed to the other and weaker sections of the society so as to bring the harmony, equality between the different classes. So we are promoting the directive principles by virtue of this Maharashtra Agriculture Land Ceiling on Holding Act 1975. Its constitutional validity was challenged in this case. Supreme Court said no. This act is a reasonable because it promotes the directive principles of state policy. So dear students, if I may conclude this discussion of relationship between the fundamental rights and directive principles of state policy, then I can say that the fallacy of conflict between fundamental rights and directive principles are seen through the decisions of the courts that if rights conferred by part third are so fundamental for the life, liberty and security of the citizens, then the directive principles contained in part fourth are equally fundamental in the governance of the country and article 37 makes it obligatory on the part of the state to apply these principles in making laws. Thus, I can say the provisions contained in either of these parts are not designed to act as a barrier to the progress, but instead both are intended to envisage a social order contemplated by the preamble of our constitution they are therefore complementary and supplementary to each other. The latest conclusion regarding relationship between fundamental rights and directive principles of state policy is that both these items contained in part third and part fourth of our constitution are complementary and supplementary to each other. No one can supersede the other one. They are like two wheels of a chariot. So there has to be a balance and harmony between part third and part fourth. 
that's why the net conclusion is that fundamental rights and directive principles of state policy are complementary and supplementary to each other. So thank you very much, dear students. Uh, God bless you more and you may succeed in your mission very soon. God bless you.